When religion wants to be worshipped, Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 5. Now this is about the temptation of Jesus Christ by Satan himself. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see, in this particular verse, what the devil was looking for is worship. And he was looking for worship from God himself. Not content to be whom he was created to be in the heavens. The scripture says clearly he was corrupted by his own image of himself. And in that corruption, he desired to be, he desired the worship of God. He saw around him, the scripture describes him actually in Ezekiel 28 as the anointed cherub. He saw around him this worship and in his heart, he thought, well, I, I am equal to God, although he's not, of course. He desired this worship and has always desired this worship. And when he said to Jesus, if you will worship me, he showed him all the kingdoms. He showed him New York City. He showed him our generation. He showed him all the political powers of the world, all the wealth that this world would be able to scavenge out of the earth as it is. And he showed it all to him. He showed him the adoration, actually, of fallen men, really. And he said, if you you worship me, it will all be yours. And it's interesting because the word in the Greek text means to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. To fawn or to crouch to someone and pay homage. This is actually the word he spoke. If you'll bow to me, if you'll be subservient to me. And of course, this was in the devil's heart right from the beginning. This is what he wanted God to do. He said, that's what he's always been after. After having fallen from grace... He wants even God himself to bend his knee to the image of himself which he has embraced. And that's really what this was. This was a blatant attempt to have, of Satan to have God bend his knee and say, Satan, I was wrong. Your image of yourself is true. It's correct. And I, I, I bow to you today. Now, that's, that's the ultimate delusion. That's the ultimate deception. It can't get any darker. I believe that's why Jesus said the words, If the light that be in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? To look at this this created being that God had created it with his own hand, and he's asking God to bend his knee before him. He had had seen the glory of God. He had had heard the worship of heaven that you and I only dream about partaking in one day. He had been there and seen it. And all this understanding that was given him had turned to an iniquity within him. And the light that was in him became darkness. How great is that darkness when any of God's creation want God to begin to bend his knee to their image that they have created of themselves. Ezekiel 28, 17, the Lord says, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, and you've corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. Now, the word wisdom in this text means true intelligence, which leads to reverence for the Lord. The skeptic, the commentation says we'll never find it and therefore we'll never know the true meaning of life. He says to Satan himself, you've, you've corrupted your wisdom because of your image of yourself. You, you could have had a knowledge and that knowledge of God would have led you to a reverence for God, but it became corrupted. Ezekiel 28:18. He says, you've defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. And the word sanctuaries means places intended for refuge and worship. In other words, Satan, where you are, the sanctuaries where people gather are defiled. And they're defiled by the multitude of your depraved actions and perversions of meaning. You are there. You manifest among the people. But you defile, God said, every place you touch, you defile it. Because you are full of depravity and you cannot speak truth. All you can do is pervert the meanings of truth. Not content to lead rebellion in heaven, Satan brought his treachery to the earth. 
Now he knew that Adam and his descendants were the very apple of God's eye, as you are today. We are the closest thing in this world to the heart of God. He loves you passionately. That's why he became a man and died for you, wanting you back to himself again. Now Satan knew this. Satan knew that Adam and his descendants, which are you and I, were the apple of God's eye. We were created by God. We were created for God to live in his love and to worship him forever. Now, Satan knew this. If Adam remained untouched, there would be multiple billions of people that would gather around the throne in, uh, in, in agreement with the angels and created beings in heaven and would worship and praise the one only and true God forever and ever. You see, this is something that he wanted for himself. And the only way he could steal this worship from God and secure it for himself was to get a man or get Adam to agree with his point of view. And what is Satan's point of view? That there are ways that are higher than God's ways. That's Satan's point of view. God doesn't know everything. His word is not the last word. There is knowledge that God is withholding from us. In Genesis 3, 4, he comes to Eve Eve knew what God had spoken, and Satan comes to Eve and says, No, you will not surely die. Verse 5, he says, God knows in the day you eat of this thing that God has forbidden, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be as gods. Of course, that was Satan's desire, to be as God himself. And you will know good and evil, which in reality is the corrupted wisdom of Satan. You will have these, this open-eyed areas in disobedience, He's promising people this open vision of heaven. He's promising them knowledge that only God can give. And he says the way to this knowledge is don't take God seriously. Don't, you don't have to come under the confines of his authority. I know he says forgive those that have wronged you, but you don't really have to do that. You see, there's another way to do this. And God just wants you to be blindly obedient. But I know a better way to do this. And if you'll follow my logic and reasoning, your eyes will be open and you will become God. You see, that was what he was after right in the beginning. In one act of disobedience, <clears throat> when Adam and Eve partook of what God had forbidden them, this nature of Satan, this rebellious, corrupted wisdom was sown into man and all of his descendants. It was sown into you. It was sown into me. That's why the Bible says we are born with a fallen nature. The scripture calls it a sin nature. Or for lack of another term, it's also called the flesh. We were born with a fallen nature. In one act of disobedience, this DNA as it is of Satan's corrupted way of thinking was sown into the human race. All that, one day, we would be captivated by him for all of eternity. Now, let's look at the immediate effect that this had on religious practice. If you'll go to Genesis chapter 4, please, with me, right in the beginning of your Bible, you're going to immediately begin to see the, the fruit of this fallen nature of Satan himself, now being embraced by God's creation, man, and how it got into religion almost immediately. Genesis chapter 4, in verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. Now, there are two brothers. They're both bringing a sacrifice of offering to God, but one is accepted by God. The inference, I think, is clear that one man had a clean and a pure heart in bringing this, and the other one didn't. And Cain, it says, was very wroth, and his countenance was fell. You see, this is, the very, this is a manifestation of Satan, really. You, you picture Satan before the throne, and all this praise is going to God, and not to him. And he, he becomes angry about it, and his countenance falls. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you wroth or angry, and why is your countenance fallen? In verse 7, he says, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin lies at the door. Now, he's reproving him. The voice of God is coming to Cain and saying to Cain, your sacrifice is not as pure as you think it is. There's a problem with your sacrifice. Now, that's what God does today. That's what he's, he's doing in this service. Some today have come in and you're lifting your hands to God, but your sacrifice may not be as clean as you think it is. You're bringing this sacrifice of praise. But there may be something in your life that God is trying to put his finger on. 
You're refusing to hear the voice of God, so therefore the Lord comes, and there's a sense that my songs are just bouncing off the ceiling. Why is the person beside me so captivated by God's presence, and I'm fighting so hard to get through? And the Lord comes to Cain, he says, if, if, if you do well, verse 7, will you not be accepted? And if you do not, well, sin lies at the door. And then he gives him a promise. He says, unto thee shall his, be his desire. In other words, sin, Satan, will desire to rule over you, but thou shalt rule over him. And so this man has a promise just like you and I do today. But what does he do with the promise? Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And here is, here is the very root of religion that wants to be worshipped. This man wants God to bend his knee to his sacrifice. And because God refuses to bend his knee to his sacrifice, he now moves to kill the man through whom God, this, this sacrifice to God is accepted. He is now moving to destroy everything that looks like God exactly as Satan has done. He has that spirit of Satan really upon him. Now, if you don't believe this, in John chapter 8, let me just read it to you. Verses 43 and 44. Jesus Christ is speaking to a religious crowd who claim to be children of Abraham. He's telling them, you're, you're going to try to kill me. They're telling him, you've got a devil. In John 8, 43, he says, Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Now he's standing, and these are Pharisees. These are religious leaders. These are supposed to be the people of God. Now before them is the purest manifestation of God's life that the world has ever known. Now they have a choice. They either bend their knee to God, or they require God to bend his knee to them. I'm trying to prove a point here. You see, the very heart of Satan finds his refuge in religion that is outside of the life of God and demands that itself be worshipped. Jesus looks at them in verse 44 and he says, You are of your father the devil. Now he's talking to Pharisees and Sadducees and lawyers and Levites. He says, You're of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was a murderer. And he was saying to them, You're going to lift me up. You're going to crucify me. And shortly after, they said to him, You say you're not even 50 years old, and you say you've seen Abraham. And he said, Surely I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. And at that moment, they took up stones to kill him. There was a choice that people had to make. You either bend your knee to God, or try to make God bend his knee to you. Satan has a ministry. Folks, Satan has a ministry today. And this ministry masquerades as the voice of God. But the voice of God comes with all of its perversions, all of its twistings and distortions of truth. Masquerading is God's voice. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15. I will read it to you. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel, or that means a messenger of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Paul warned the church. There are false apostles. There are false preachers. There are false teachers. They themselves will not bend their knee to God. They stand in pulpits. And Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 18 and 19, they speak great swelling words of vanity. And the, actually the word vanity in the Greek text means worthlessness. They allure or draw through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. And the word wantonness means the, the readiness for all pleasure, acknowledging no restraints. They promise freedom, but they are servants of their own corruption. And that means they're full of inward decay and ruin. May I paraphrase this for you? Peter says, these are the types of people who are going to make it into pulpits, especially in the last days. They speak great, swelling, worthless words. They allure people through the lusts of their flesh, and they lead them to all pleasure, which acknowledges no restraints. They promise freedom. They speak a lot about freedom, but they themselves are slaves of their own inward decay and ruin. Now, folks, I've often wondered... It's been a perplexing thing to me over the years. How do so many people, especially in our generation, in houses of religion, 
How do they become so deceived that they will actually give much and sometimes all of their resources to spiritual charlatans, frauds, and thieves? The airways are full of them today. Pulpits are full of them. They are charlatans, they are frauds, and they are thieves. How is it that so many people are giving their strength and everything they have to these men? You see, the answer is found in our opening text today. Satan said to Jesus, If you will worship me, everything will be yours. If you will worship me. I'm willing to give it up. If you will declare me in my present condition to be godly. Oh, folks, you've got to hear me on this. There are people sitting in houses and that spirit is in them. It's the spirit of religion that wants to be worshipped. And they sit before preachers and they say, Preacher, I'll, I'll give you everything I've got. I'll give you all my bank account. I'll give you my resources. I'll give you my strength. If you will just bend your knee to my religion and declare me to be godly, it will all be yours. Jeremiah had them in his day. And Jeremiah spoke about these particular types of preachers. Jeremiah chapter 5. Let me read it to you for time's sake. For among my people are found wicked men. Verses 26 to 28. They lay wait as he that sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they become great and they become rich. They're waxing fat. They shine. Oh, they stand out as God's great men and women of the hour. They'll do everything they can to shine and have persons' admirations. Yet, it says, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper. And the right of the needy do they not judge. Oh, preacher, tell me I'm godly. Don't talk to me about my sin. Don't call me an adulterer. Don't call me a liar. Don't call me a thief. Don't call me immoral. Don't tell me I'm prayerless. Don't, don't tell me that my ambitions may not be in line with God's will for my life. Tell me I'm godly and you will have it all. I'll give it all to you if you just tell me I'm godly. Preacher, tell me everything is well. Preacher, tell me I'm going to heaven. Preacher, tell me I've got a great future ahead of me. Oh, preacher, tell me what I want to hear about myself. Confirm the image of myself that I have created all around myself and you have everything. You'll have it all if you'll just bend your knee to me. If you'll tell me of some destiny of greatness and power that awaits me over men's lives. Deuteronomy 29, 19 says, It shall come to pass that when he hears the words of this curse, that he blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart. We're living in a generation of people who are gravitating to preachers. And they're saying, oh, tell me I'll have peace even though I'm charting my own course. I'm living my own way. I'm, I'm creating my own standards of right and wrong. I'm determining what is acceptable to God and what is not acceptable. Tell me I'll have peace, preacher, and it will all be yours. And he goes on to say, to add drunkenness to thirst. Not only do these people have a thirst that's not satisfied, but now they're intoxicated with a false peace. Preacher, if you bow down to my desires and tell me that giving will only increase my personal wealth and position, it will all be yours. If you'll worship me, and if you'll let me be God, if you'll let me be my own God, and if you'll worship me, it will all be yours. Declare me to be equal with God. Tell me I'm able to chart my own course without consequence. By God's grace, you'll never hear that kind of foolishness in this house. But there are many places where you will hear it. And you're warned today. You choose to sit under this kind of thing. You're sitting under the ministry of Satan himself. Misguided, crooked, corrupted view of God and God's people and God's humanity. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom, the Lord said in Ezekiel 28, 17. You have corrupted your wisdom. You have twisted and perverted truth. Now in contrast to this, Go with me to Matthew chapter 2, please. Considering the season that we're living in right now, there's a great, great contrast to all of this religion that wants to be worshipped. 
Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Now, this is, of course, speaking about the birth of Jesus. These are wise men. And in verse 11, it says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And the interesting thing is, when, when worship is true worship, the voice of God is immediately heard. You don't need anybody to tell you what God is saying. In the very next verse, it says, In being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. You see, wisdom is found in the true worship of God. There's no other way. Satan's wisdom is corrupted. And those who sit under this type of ministry sit under a corrupted wisdom. It, it portrays itself as light, but it is in fact a very deep darkness. And if it gets a hold of the person, it causes them to be angry when they are standing in the actual presence of the voice of God. And they say, God, if you will not bend your knee to me, then I will not bend my knee to you. I'm out of here. I didn't come here for this kind of preaching. I came here for somebody to tell me that I'm going to be rich and famous and prosperous and everything is going to be well. Well, folks, if I do that and send you to hell, what good am I doing for your soul? If you're living in adultery, I'd better tell you you're living in adultery. If you're stealing at work, I'd better tell you you're stealing. Because the Bible says no thief inherits the kingdom of God. If you're a liar, I'd better call you a liar if I'm speaking for God. Because the scripture says whatever makes a lie in Revelation dwells outside of the city of God. I'd better tell you. I'd better stand here with the Spirit of God upon me. I'd better speak for God and challenge everything in you and I that is causing this sacrifice that we suppose is acceptable to God to be not acceptable to Him. Wisdom is found in true worship of God. These men laid down their treasures at His feet. These were kings. They didn't have to come here. But they laid down their treasures at His feet with no thought of personal advantage. They were content that somehow their gifts would further the objectives of God through this child for humanity. What could they hope? Here's this ragtag band of Mary and her... Uh, they couldn't even hardly afford clothing for their child. He was in swaddling clothes, which is a poor person's clothes. Here they are in a stable, not in a palace. And these kings come in and they lay down their gifts. There is no hope of any return from this. But wisdom is justified, Jesus said of her children. These men were content at seeking His likeness and fell down and worshipped Him. I am content, God, if you choose to manifest yourself in a way I don't understand and in a way that may not further any personal objective I have in my life. I don't care. I bring what I have to you and I lay it at your feet and I am content to worship you in your likeness. Now, in one sense, this scene represents a reawakening of wisdom. It's a return to the knowledge that God's ways are higher than our ways. See, when Satan fell... He inverted that knowledge. I have ways that are higher than God's. He came down into the garden. He inverted that knowledge and said, no, there are ways that are higher than God's. And so does sin nature in man, that very nature of his own heart. And now we see with these wise men at Christmas time, as we've come to know it, I see a reawakening of wisdom, a coming in and a giving to something that doesn't make sense to the natural mind. There's no hope of personal advantage. But God, you know what you're doing. And your ways are higher than our ways. Satan comes in the fullness of pride, self-exaltation and rebellion. But Christ comes in the fullness of humility, self-abasement and obedience. The only way God could show us the way out of this religious dilemma is to come as a man and show us the path that we need to walk. Let this mind be in you. The scripture says it was also in Christ Jesus. Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now it was robbery for Satan to even think he could be equal with God. But Christ was equal with God. And it was not robbery to declare himself equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation. And took upon himself the form of a servant. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He came to show the way out of this dilemma. Follow me as I'm following my father. He tells us today, you follow me. 
David says, God, deliver me. And that should be the cry of every person in this house. God, deliver me. Don't let me be like Cain in my service to you. Don't let me ever stand hard-hearted in your house. Jesus Christ, help me. Help me to have an open heart. This is about eternity. This is about heaven. Jesus, this is about the honor of your name in the earth before you come and take your church home to yourself. If ever we should be crying this out, it's now in this generation. God, deliver my poor heart from anything in me that wants you, Jesus, to bend your knee to my image of myself. Deliver me and give me the power to bend my knee to you. God Almighty, I will be satisfied with how you choose to reveal yourself to me. I don't have to ask all the questions and I don't need to know all the answers. I just know in my heart that you are God and there is no other God beside you. You are Lord and King. You have the plans to my life. No one else holds the plans to my life. Whether sorrow or in pain, whether in sickness or in health, whether in prosperity or whether in poverty, I will serve you. I will trust you with all of my days and my lips will glorify your name. I will be satisfied to walk in repentance. That means I will agree quickly with you when something in my life offends your truth. I will be satisfied. I will never ask you, God, to bend your knee to a corrupted image of myself that I have embraced. I will be satisfied. God, you have my heart. You can speak to me. You overthrow every table of doves. You, you push back every stone. You expose everything that displeases your name. My heart is open to you, God. I bend my knee to you. I bend my knee to you. I will be satisfied to give what you give me, asking nothing in return knowing that everything you have promised will sustain me. You will keep me, God. I don't have to keep myself. You will keep me. I will take to you everything you give to me, like Hannah took Samuel to you. Even if it's the most precious thing to my heart, I will give it to you, God, for your use. And you have promised to be my God and to sustain me all the days of my life. I will be satisfied to be engaged with your work, which is reclaiming the lost. This is the work of God. I will be satisfied to be a testimony of your love and your grace. I will speak of Calvary. I will speak of the cross. I will speak of suffering. I will speak of sin. I will speak of your blood. I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will be satisfied to let your life be my enabling power within to do your work. Hallelujah. Oh God. I will be satisfied to let your life be my enabling power to do the work of God. I'll be satisfied with you, Lord Jesus, and you only will I serve. Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. Get thee behind me. Get thee behind me with all your theology. Get thee behind me with your perversions of truth and wisdom. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and say, Get thee behind me. You savor not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Get thee behind me, Satan. I will not bend my knee to you. I will only bend my knee to God.